You won't realize it now, but it's later on when you start to see the fruit of your labor and actually enjoy the fruits of your labor that you're like, wow, this was worth it. That seed stage, that, I won't even say the seed stage, the minute that you say yes to God, the minute that you just say, okay, all bets are in, you know, I'm ready to throw in the towel, is when all hell starts breaking loose. y'all welcome to fellowship i'm your girl reese this is fellowship where we come hungry and we leave full physically spiritually and mentally as you guys can see there's no guest on my couch um but no this is just gonna be me solo dolo you know um i'm excited about this episode actually because i didn't it wasn't planned but i have a wonderful team who was like you know clarice you should really do one by yourself you should really talk about, you know, just your reflection of just, you know, the, the past year and so much more. And I felt like, you know, why not? I think it's really good that we've gone through um, seven episodes. This will be the seventh. And it's a little bittersweet because it is the season finale of Fellowship. And wow, I cannot believe we have been filming for about five to six months. Um, this was just yesterday and we're already here. It's, it's just, it's very, it's, it's very weird yet, um, exciting and still at the same time bittersweet because I have enjoyed this ride. I have truly enjoyed this journey. It's been great. However, I don't really want it to end at the same time. I really don't. Man, we're going to talk about a lot of things. We're going to talk about a lot of things. Uh, some of the topics that I brought up in past episodes. Some of the guests that I've also had on past episodes as well. And just some highlights and some, I would say, some learning experiences that I think that anybody that is starting something new like myself could actually, you know, relate to. And um, I want us to connect, you know, as the, as the host or moderator I want us to connect and I want, you know, people to understand that you can do it too after hearing some of the things that I'm going to talk to you guys about today. But um, I have an agenda because I got a lot to say. This, this has been quite, I say I've been filming for about five to six months, but honestly, I have been going through a transition and a journey, a transformation, I would say, for the past, I want to say, two years. And it's been... It's been quite challenging. It's been beautiful to watch. I think that there's nothing more beautiful than watching something grow. And sometimes when you're in the seed stage, it's not really exciting just because, you know, that seed stage, you're like, man, when am I going to get there? When am I actually going to get there? But I, I have now, I've really enjoyed seeing it go from um, the seed to a flower. Um, so... Let's get into it. Let's talk about something. Um, so the origin. You know, I think that with many platforms, people, you know, you have the the host and you have the guest and you see the show and you're like, man, it's such a good show. But how did it start? What was the why? Where did it begin? You know, and I think it's what greater place than to start at the origin. Um, so just... I'm not going to go into much detail about my the food, my chef life or my food life and things like that, but I um, came from the food industry, and um, I was in food for about 10 years. I would say eight of that, I was a caterer. And then the last two years, I cooked for professional athletes, a private chef, 
cooked for postpartum moms and so much more. And um, catering, catering actually didn't start the foundation. I was a food blogger before I became a caterer. And this is around like when I was about maybe 22 years old or so. So I was doing that and I got into the, uh, the world of catering. Eventually though, I would say in 2021, 2022, my desire to cater decreased significantly. I didn't love it. I wasn't, not necessarily that I was unhappy, but I was searching for more. I needed more. And I wanted something that I think served me. And most importantly, I wanted something that would show, would display my purpose. So um, I think that me jumping into catering, though, was a blessing in disguise, though, because I think that's kind of what all roads led here. You know, so cooking for athletes was a whole different ball game. And I say that because athletes are a bit more laid back and their their demand for certain meals is very very low and their personalities are very I mean it's, it's they're they're not they're not as vibrant they're they're very very introverted a lot of them um I've only cooked for four athletes, by the way, uh, four athletes, but a lot of times they're very introverted or they're just kind of quiet and things like that. But I mean, they were, they were still very friendly and, and, and such. But I think what was interesting about being an athlete chef was that, or just even doing private chef gigs in general, was that I would be in these spaces and I'm cooking different types of dinners for them and they're choosing to stay in the kitchen with me and just have a conversation and just talk. And what really, really, I think, pushed um, this idea for me especially was when I cooked for one of my players and I remember making jell-off rice for them. Making jell-off rice for them and they kind of, they kind of, they, they were, first of all, it was their first time having jell-off rice. And they were kind of like taken aback that they were trying something new because they were very, and this particular player was like, this is what I want every week. So I was very shocked that they even requested jell rice. So I remember dishing out the food and putting it on plates and passing out to some of the people in the living room. And the atmosphere and the community that they invited to their home was so inviting. Everybody was loving on each other. They're talking, they're laughing, they're having different types of conversations. And it took me back to my childhood. It took me back to where my parents, we host, we host Thanksgiving every year at my parents' house, every year. And we just, we just refuse to go to other people's house. <laughs> so we would always have a full house. And I just remember people coming over for Thanksgiving, you know, people not only getting a plate, but people are drinking wine in the corner. People are having conversations. People are coming back from school, telling us how college is going and so much more. It's just, the atmosphere was just beautiful. It's just, it's inviting. And it's just, I mean, you want to love on everybody. Even if you don't know somebody inside the room, you still feel invited. And it just immediately made me think about that. And I remember talking to my little brother and I was like, man, like, what if we televised this? What if we talked about, what if we talk, had conversations over food and we had, you know, meals and so much more, but we just televised it. We had cameras. And I was like, well, maybe I just need to have a cooking show. And my little brother told me, he said, I don't think that we should put its peak at a cooking show, though, just based on your personality. And I didn't really understand what that meant at that, at that time. I didn't understand what that meant at all. And I was just kind of like, you know, okay, you know, I didn't think too much of it. But I think that being in food and just being able to meet so many people over the years and being given all these different opportunities to cook for certain people, people of tomorrow, and even some of my loved ones, friends, family, you name it, has given me the opportunity to really understand the gift of communication. And I think that's when I realized, I think I, I just like to communicate. I'm a communicator. And that's kind of what led me here, I want to say. And it could be other things that God revealed to me. I don't know. But uh, that was, I think, what really made me say, okay, it's time. Now, that time that I was thinking about something like this, 
I never once imagined that it would actually be televised. You know how you're just talking about something and it's just an idea and you're like, oh, okay, you know, we'll write, we'll write it down. We'll do away with it. And if it comes around, it comes around. But um, I don't think I really truly understood the power behind um, the words that I had spoke at that time. You know, words are powerful. It's biblical. Um, so let's even, let's, let's dive deep into just doing something new. So first things first. I am a believer. I am an unapologetic believer. Um, anybody that knows me personally knows that. One thing I'm going to do is cover you. I'm going to pray over you. I'm going to pray over myself, but I will pray over a lot of things, even the smallest things. I just feel um, God is my source, and I just don't feel the need to argue about that. And that's just point blank, period. So now that we got that out of the way, <laughs> Um, doing something new. So before doing something new, I was in corporate America for about 10 years at the same time that I am pursuing food as an entrepreneur, as a caterer, a chef, whatever you want to call it. And I, at the same time, I'm in corporate America and I was either being a, I was either a project manager, a consultant, a business analyst, and those were my roles, pretty much. And so doing such roles, I was, I won't say I was just so excited or just so happy. I think I was more so grateful to be making the money I was making, especially at my age. Um, in my early 20s, my mid 20s, um, I was doing a lot of great things. I was doing things that um, my parents probably would have never imagined doing in their 20s and or or it could be even some of my peers had never done before at that time but I started off pretty early just you know traveling the world um being able to experience things that I don't even think I wrote down for myself but I had the 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 money to do it I I had the salary to do it I had the resources not just in corporate america but also as an entrepreneur so I I had that that experience in corporate America and I I am very grateful for it. I don't think anything is wasted at all. And um I'm actually going on 2 years being out of corporate America, which is very long for me because there's been times in my career where I've kind of gone back and forth to corporate America. I'm in, I'm out. I'm in, I'm out. Then I'll make the decision. I'm like, "Okay, I'm completely out." But then I still got one foot in because that security, that security, I think, had me in a chokehold because I was just used to always making sure that things are taken care of. And that's just always how it's been. So being in a, a place where I had to now choose between security or surrendering to God is when it got really real. It got very real. And um, so surrender, surrender. I think like uh, this time last year, I was, oh man, I was sad. This time last year, I was very sad. I was dealing with a lot of transition. And what I realized is I, was, I wasn't sad because I wasn't happy with myself um, or with people. I was sad because what I once knew is no longer the thing that's going to serve me in the next phase of my life. And sometimes when you are comfortable in a place, and especially if the place is not necessarily destroying you, it, it doesn't mean that it's, a detri it's detrimental or it's, it's hurting you and it's making you become weak um, because I was in a fine space. I didn't feel like I needed to leave, but God was ready to closed that door and put me in a different dimension. And I wasn't ready for that. And, you know, I hate when, I hate sometimes when people think that doing something new is sexy. It's not. You know, it doesn't become sexy until you keep consistently doing the work. And it doesn't become something that you truly admire until you do the work. You won't realize it now 
But it's later on when you start to see the fruit of your labor and actually enjoy the fruits of your labor that you're like, wow, this was worth it. That seed stage, that, I won't even say the seed stage, the minute that you say yes to God, the minute that you just say, okay, all bets are in, you know, I'm ready to throw in the towel, is when all hell starts breaking loose. And I still remember the day that I told God yes. It was October 4th, 2022. And this actually happened to be the very last basketball player that I cooked for. And I, what I thought I was saying yes to was me just, I'm done. I left corporate America August 2022, and which I'll talk about because I didn't make the choice to leave. They let me go. So for me, that was a, oh, wow, okay. Um, I really am not supposed to be here. Um, and the way I even got in my last position, something in my heart knew that I wouldn't be there long, but I, I didn't put a timetable on it. I just said that, you know, I mean, a timestamp on it. I just, I just was like, you know, I'm just, I'm just gonna, I'm not going to be here long and I will just, you know, collect my coins as much as I can and, and, and how long, as long as I can. And then I can just make the decision to, to, to leave. And that wasn't the case. So after leaving, I actually got a gig with uh, my last basketball player that I didn't even know would be my last. Um, cooked uh, for them for about a month or so. And then that also ended. And then it was just me. So I told you guys, I told God, yes, October 4, 2022. Literally, I want to say the last week of October, Um, or no, the week of my birthday, I was at dinner with my husband and I spoke about how I don't believe I'm going to be, something in my spirit told me, I don't think I'm going to be an athlete ship for a long time. I don't think I'm going to be cooking um, in that space any longer. Um, And that if I am going to be cooking, it's just for a means. So I, uh, I definitely was kind of shocked and when it ended as, as abrupt as it did, and I was just like, okay, so now I'm now put in a position where I don't have a choice. And some of us have been put in positions where we don't have a choice but to, to do as he says, you know, the father that is. So I didn't realize that my yes was more powerful than I thought. Like I said, words are powerful. So given my yes... I was, I didn't have a choice but to be all in. So I got into, now we're jumping into 2023, January 2023. And I am very, very just like confused at this point. And like I said, I'm a believer and I'm like, well, God is not a God of confusion. God is not someone that is ever surprised either by what you're going through, you know? He orchestrated it, you know? So I was sitting there and I was in confusion. I was like, so where do I go from here? Where is my career going? I'm so used to being in an office. I'm so used to working remotely. I'm so used to having an extra laptop somewhere. I'm used to being on call. And it just came to a point where January 23, I had to learn how to unplug. I have always been on the go. I have always made myself available to others Um, I have even, you know, just even learned to just, or just thought I should carry other people's burdens and much more. I felt that I had to just always make myself available for people that I love and cared about. And even for, even sometimes even strangers, because, you know, I just, I I have the thought process that, you know, that could be me that needs somebody, if that makes sense. But anywho, you know, um... That time, so this month last year, I remember talking to my brother and my husband and having very hard conversations and having hard conversations that I had to kind of come to terms with that, like, hey, the corporate door is closed. It's closed shut. And I think, you know how you are in denial about certain things that are happening to you. You're, you're, you're running through the motions of life, yes, but you're, you're like, you know, I'm still going to go and see if I can still pursue it. Because, I mean, I got the resume for it. I have the, the pedigree. I have the skill set. I have um, the brains to do it. And it's possible. 
And I found myself still trying to apply for roles that I've had in the, in the past because I felt like, well, I know how to do it. And let me just, at least let me just, you know, earn the income. Let me just have some resources. Nobody was hiring me. Nobody. And somebody like me, I've always kept a job. I have worked for a very long time. I've always had my own. And I've typically never really had to ask people for much. Um, and and it's not to, that's not a, that's not to flex or anything like that, but it's, it's the truth. You know, just based on my experience, you know, I've always been, even the child in my household, that I kept a good job. I I didn't mind helping my family out financially. I didn't mind being there and and showing up because I felt like I should, you know, and, and that's my family, you know. But I think that with those type of things comes a sense of pride, and it also gives you um, a it gives you this type of control. Unknowingly, you don't realize that you are a control freak as well. And when you are put in leadership roles or authority, when you didn't ask for it, you start to feel connected to that. And that's what you now label yourself as. Well, I'm, you know, I'm the oldest. I'm the leader. I'm the this. I'm the that. And so that's kind of how you move, you know? And I, I'm not a disrespectful person at all, but I think that with those type of titles, you start to feel entitled, <laughs> you know, and you and you don't even you don't even recognize yourself sometimes, you know. And I, I just I felt like those because I had those issues. I think that's one of the things that kind of made me sad last year, this time last year, because I'm now having to surrender to God, but I'm dying to those layers of Reese. I'm dying to all those different titles, the consultant, the project manager, the chef, the entrepreneur, the boss woman, the boss babe. I'm dying to all of those titles because as far as God is concerned, he just needed me without all the extra things that everybody has named me, you know? He just wanted me and my attention and my obedience and my surrender. So, you know, those different layers of Reese that was inside of me, I was not willing to let go. I wasn't willing to let that go because as far as I'm concerned, that was me. That was a part of me. And I felt like I'm not hurting anyone. So why is it why is it that I have to break away from that part of me, you know? Um, what I realized, too, is, you know, with those type of titles, I was kind of, you know, I was, I was becoming, be, beginning to be married to moments. I was beginning to be married to moments um, because with all those titles, you will have a sense of thinking that you have now hit your peak. Oh, um, okay, I got a new job. My salary just boosted 25%. Every role I've had, my salary increased 25 to 30%. Every role I've had. And I was blessed. I, I, I'm so grateful for that. I got to experience that. However, with that um, comes a, it comes this mindset that you've made it now. And when you feel like you've made it, you don't feel the need to go further. And I, that's coming from a very ambitious person. I'm a very ambitious person. I, I'm typically one that when I want to do something, I'll stick to it and I do the work and I keep going. However, there were moments where I just felt like I've hit my peak. So what's the point of doing the work? What's the point? And, you know, and when you feel like you've hit your, fe- your peak, you think that you're too wise. You become too wise for yourself. And I, I am forever grateful for 2023. As first of all, it was my hardest, my more, my most tearful, and most challenging year I've ever had. And I'm sure there's more challenges to come. Being in a new space, however, last year I think was a way for me to die to myself, my old ways. And I think that people think that dying to yourself is only if you are blatantly a bad person, whatever whatever you define as bad, you know. I think that it's just you dying to the old ways in order to get into a new dimension. It's like I had a conversation with my friend, Gerald. I was discussing with him how, you know, 
entering an open door is, is beautiful. But at the same time, you don't even know what's inside of that door. You know, I, me entering into a new door, I was coming from a place where nothing bad was happening. Nothing was wrong. I, it, I just knew it was time for me to move on. So, you know, you just see a bright light from this open door. You have no idea what's inside until you walk inside. And then you have your moments when you walk into the open door, you want to get out immediately. You want to get the hell out because what you thought it would be, it's not it. And what I find is that that seed stage, that beginning stage, um, initially when you're trying to do something new is when all the warfare, the challenges, everything starts happening all at once. And you feel like you have made the biggest mistake of your life. And that's just the game of surrender. In the beginning, it's never going to be what you thought it would be. Um, what I realized too is when I, when I felt like God was telling me, okay, let's, let's move on. Let's go, let's go do something new. Was that, um, I, I genuinely wasn't ready. I wasn't ready. You know, I had to ask this question, but, um, you know, why is it that choosing God is a harder pill to swallow than leaving a job that you hate? For whatever reason, when, when God says, let's go, we, we have to make a decision. We have to sit down. We have to deliberate. We have to go back and forth with him. We have to wrestle with the problem of, we have to wrestle with um, the problems that we may face. We're like, you know, okay, we're not there yet. We got to get the resources. We got to get the finances. We have to have the team, the people first before we actually commit to it. But we'll go to a job that we hate. And I think what the problem is with that is that with the job, because we're commit, we're we're like, well, we know what's gonna happen. If we go to work, we're gonna get paid. But if we say yes to God, we're not sure if He's gonna show up. We're not sure if He's going to do what He said He's gonna do. And yet we have faith that this job is gonna be here when we get there in the morning, forgetting that there's such things as layoffs, furloughs, and so many things. And people get fired. People get let go. Like the economy's change. We forget all those things happen. But we're sitting that we're we choose to sit and have a deliberation first in a whole meeting, or a, like what we like to call it in corporate America a daily stand up, before we actually commit the thing to God. Because we're like, well, we don't know. We don't we don't know what the end result is, Lord. So we're going to have to go and do. Um, we're going to have to continue what we're what we're doing. You know, I know we hate this job, but hey, it's paying the bills. I know we hate this area, but, you know, I'll, I'll, all I got to do is ignore it, you know, and it's, it's just it's just very interesting. And I'm not I'm not here to judge nobody because, baby, I was there. OK, <laughs> so, you know, it's just really um, interesting. But um, I think that, you know, my reasoning for doing something new like this, it was very scary. I had to overcome the thing of fear. I didn't even know I was fearful of something, too. That's another thing. I didn't know I was scared of this. But I think that uh, doing something new is very scary. And that's why we feel like we have to go in those deliberations. We have to feel like we have to keep going back to our journal and keep writing. We keep having to keep um, write. We we keep inventing things and um, putting it back on the shelf and putting it in the archive, leaving it in our phones. We feel like we don't need to put out that content right now because we're, we're just scared. We're scared of the outcome, what people will think, how we, how, how we will be perceived by others, you know, and so much more. It's just, fear is just, it's different for everyone, you know, um, but I think my only reasoning behind not wanting to do something um, new is because I've never done it before. And financially, it didn't make sense. I just felt, you know, it's not the season right now. Why do I need to do this right now? It's not, it's not time. And, you know, financially, I need to save this first before I can do this. And quite frankly, <laughs> I knew that God was not convinced because for the fact that he gave me the idea and the plan, he knew exactly what he was doing. And I think that the biggest fear when I'm talking to other people too, whenever they're talking to me about what kind of what they're starting and, you know, they're asking for advice and so many things. Um, financial stability 
is, I think, one of the biggest fears around stuff like this, you know, because we think that we don't have enough. Well, I have news for you. It's never going to be enough. It's never going to be enough. And, you know, what if you, what if you never get it? What if you never get the financial stability in order for you to start that thing? You know, I think that one of the things that I had to learn while exercising my faith is understanding that if he gave it to you, he already put a date on it. It's already been time stamped. There's already a date on it. He's already equipped you with the tools, the finances, the people, the everything in order for you to go and do what you're supposed to be doing. And so we have this thing in our minds that if we don't have the plethora of things yet, we're not supposed to begin. When God is like, I'm just looking for your yes and I'm just looking for you to walk. Just walk behind me and just follow me. That's all God is asking for us to do. And that's, that's typically it. So this idea of us having to, to start when we have it, it's after experiencing what I've experienced for the past couple of years now, um, that's so wrong. You know, and I realized that too because I have a bachelor's in marketing. I have a master's in business. And even with my degrees, that could have never prepared me for this. Your pedigree has nothing to do with what you're called to do. The very thing that you majored in could be the exact opposite of what you're actually called to do. And that's just what it is. Some of us think that, and please, I'm, I went to school. I, I'm, I'm educated. I'm very educated. And I'm grateful for having the gift of education and having degrees. However, my degrees could have never prepared me for this. Did not prepare me for this at all. And I think that what, my, what being in the business school did prepare me for was probably just being an uh, entrepreneurship. But even with, even with that, it's, diff- it's a difference when it's, when it's um, school-based and actually real world. Two different worlds. Two different. And the perspectives are just different because I don't think school will teach you the reality of what it is to work with difficult people. Um, actually plan. Knowing how to negotiate how to deal, how to have hard conversations, all the mental things that, or the personal things that people are dealing with and are struggling with, your school, or I don't care what university you went to, they're not preparing you for that. It is life that's preparing you for that and just the different types of experiences. And I, um, I realized that later on in my career that my degrees couldn't have prepared me for this. Um, and nonetheless, I'm still very grateful for it. Um, so with surrendering, you know, it came to a point, you know, I was very sad. I mean, last year I was really, really sad. I unplugged. I took a year off from social media, um, from people, from things, from places. And I think that it was just literally me and my family and my husband, you know, that I was truly uh, communicating with because I didn't realize that I needed it. Um, You know, I want people to understand, I don't, don't ever feel guilty for unplugging. Don't ever feel guilty for just taking a step back because when you're doing something new, my dear, you have to change your environment and your environment plays a huge part. And it's, and, and here's the thing, because I think that people think that when I say environments, oh, the bad people in your life. No, you're, you know, you will have environments that are wonderful. They're copacetic. They're beautiful. I mean, you have a loving family and so much more, but there are going to be people in your environment that have no idea. They don't even understand the magnitude of what you are called to do. You don't even understand the magnitude of what you're called to do. That's why you should unplug. That's why you should take a step back because, I mean, just, this is just asking, you know, if you're, if you're in a space and you're trying to learn how to be a baker, are you going to go to a mechanic shop? You're not. 
So if I want to learn how to be a baker, I'm going to go to the nearest bakery. So when I say change your environment, what I'm saying is that make the decision to start making some changes within those circles, within those places that you're in. And the people that love you will understand, you know, and there's going to be moments where, like myself, you will feel guilty for, you know, keeping the people that you love. It feels like you're putting them on a back burner. It feels like you're not, you're being secretive. It feels like you don't want to let them in. When, in all honesty, sometimes you just can't put words to what you're feeling. You can't put words to how you're feeling and what that thing is. You can't put words to what is missing in your life. And you're trying to understand what this new space that you're in. And quite frankly, you have to cut the noise. You have to cut the noise. And that noise could be the exact thing that you just need to turn off in order to actually be successful in what you're called to do. So if it means to change your environment, please do it. I think that every one of us in some season has come to a place where it's just we we can't describe what we're feeling. Everything hurts at the same time. Um, we're trying to also please others. We don't want to hurt other people's feelings because these are people that we genuinely care about. You know, I mean, last year, unplugging, I didn't realize how much I made myself available to a lot of people. My phone was either ringing off the hook um, and it came to a point I had to literally turn off my phone. I had to turn it off and really hone in. I really had to. It was a very emotional time for me. And I'm not typically one that is emotional all the time. But last year really, really took a toll on me. So it was just emotional, like I said, because I was dying to those layers. I was all those parts of me that was like, oh, I got to show up for that person. Oh, I got to I gotta make sure I'm here for this person. Mm-mm. And I also felt very guilty. And that guilt made me really say, okay, you need to remove yourself from social media, from, from places, things. It just, I just started unplugging. I started like just cutting the umbilical cord everywhere, <laughs> you know? And doing such really, really showed me who I was. And I think that moment really put a mirror in my face. And it, it it just, it really taught me that I really did not give God my full attention. I was not, I, and, and to me, I'm like, I'm a believer. You know, I, I really, I'm, I pray, I do this, I do that. I mean, I'm counting the different things that I, I'm telling God this, I'm arguing, I'm, I'm telling God, well, I do all these things. I pray to you, I do this, I do that. Why do I feel this way? And It dawned on me now that I've cut all the noise. Well, I felt like I cut all the noise and I didn't realize that I hadn't turned myself off yet. I was still, although I did all the external work internally, I hadn't turned down the volume yet. And so until I learned how to be still, be quiet, get in my prayer closet, sit by myself and really understand who I was is when I realized, okay, I can hear God now. He had my full attention. And so it was still very hurtful though, because I didn't want to be quiet. I did not want to turn my volume down. I didn't want to be quiet because in my mind, I felt like my feelings, I like me, me talking back to God or telling him how I felt, it was justified. It was justified. My feelings were justified. That's how I felt. I felt like, well, if I'm going to be doing something new and, and well, if I'm not going to be doing here or, or talking to these people, can you at least give me one person that I can talk to? It was me and my husband. And love my husband because 
there was moments where I didn't even know how to articulate how I was feeling about this transition and just the transformation and what I was going through. I didn't even know how to put in, it into words. And he never made me feel guilty about that. He would just sit and support the best way that he could. And it, and I, I could only imagine how difficult it was for him to watch me, you know, cry, get upset, and, you know, be in these fetal positions because I was, I was genuinely scared for my career. And then, you know, somebody telling me, like, look, what if I told you I don't want you to work? My husband supported that I don't work. He was like, I don't even want you to go and do something that you don't need to be doing right now. And we had never typically had that conversation because I was always scared to say it. I remember um, telling my brother last year that I am a little frightened to talk to my husband about this because I've always had my own. I've always done these certain things, you know, and it's always worked for me. And then it was finally when I just sat down and I said, look, I think God is calling me to do something new and I just don't know if I need to work. And he was like, you know, what's funny is that I was driving, um, I was driving, I was heading to the store, I was heading somewhere, and I thought to myself, I said, what if she just doesn't work this season? What if she just kind of just relaxes for some time? Because it looks like she needs some time off. Because he, he noticed, he said that even when my last year of catering, I didn't look like I wanted to even be there. And, you know, you think that people are not paying attention to you, and they are definitely paying attention to you. And this is somebody, I mean, I live with. He sees what I'm doing every day. You know, he's monitoring, and, you know, he's, we study each other or whatever. But, you know, when he said that, immediately the anxiety of me wanting to voice that to him completely disappeared. It just went away, you know. And, you know, let's, let's, let's keep it a buck. In this generation, the, the topic of 50-50 is so prominent. It's so, I mean, it's, it's been dragged. It's been, I mean, that conversation, it's, it's very cringe now. It's, it's just a disgusting conversation, if you ask me. That is so prominent right now that it's, it almost puts a fear to even discuss it with people that you care about and love. You know, you're almost scared to share like, hey, you know, Look, this season has changed. Do I discuss this with that person? Because I have the fear of that person may say, may discourage me to go and pursue the things that God has called me to do. And so the fact that my husband was like, absolutely not. You don't need to work right now. Go and invest in your dreams. That was all I needed. That was enough, you know? And I didn't realize that I needed my husband more in, in that season than ever until we truly had that conversation. So very, very grateful for him. Um, so with that being said, going moving forward, um, I'm now in a place, okay, I'm surrendering. I'm, I'm, I'm now trying to, I'm learning to embrace the new. And now this new is requiring, requiring me to study. So studying is free, let me tell you. You want to go know something, you want to go learn something, go study. So I'm thinking now about um, getting mentored. I got mentored, and they are still my mentors to this day, and actually my uh, pastors as well. And I love them, love them so much. And... I was being mentored and coached by them for six months. What I thought was going to start off as three, it ended up being six months. And that was very, very challenging and very, very hard for me because I've never really had someone put a mirror in my face and tell me, 
you know, tell me about myself. And they were not disrespectful at all, but they were pretty much talking about the certain things that, you know, that I, that I have that are, that are inside of me that I never, ever, that I never, you know, spoke on. And they were not, they were not negative things at all. Um, they were actually beautiful and they were gifts that I didn't even know that I carried. And I just remember on one of our coaching calls, just crying my eyes out because I could not believe that God trusted me so much with such gifts. And I could not believe that he chose me for it. And, you know, and this is why I'm very big on, you know, checking on your strong friends, your your ambitious friends, your 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 go-getter friends, because even they too don't believe that they can do it. Even they too, um, they don't feel like they're enough for something. And, you know, they there's sometimes there's a front that's put up that they, you know, oh yeah, I'm, I can do this, I can do that. Like, no, a lot of times there's that insecurity that they can never be good enough. You know, so being mentored by the best, some of the best communicators I've ever came across in my life um, was totally worth the investment. And, you know, getting coached is, I want to let people know that it's not an expense, it's an investment. It is an investment, especially if you're in a new space that you have no idea what it's about. You have no idea what is to come with it. You're, you're just, you're clueless. It's important that you go get leaders. You cannot spiritually feed yourself. Um, you, you can to a certain extent. You can to a certain extent. But honestly, you have to be led as well. You know, and, you know, people still ask me, you know, how did you find them? How did you do this? It was just, I was talking to a, another sister in Christ that was that knows me very well, and um, she connected me to them. And from the first consultation, the rest was history. And so I spent with them six months, never missed a session. I remember being in Punta Cana last August and still making sure that I call in and um, sitting in my session for an hour, two hours. I didn't care about what was going on. I invested the time. I really wanted to learn about this new space that I'm getting in and really understand who I was as a person. You know, I think a lot of times when we're starting something new, we forget that we are looking, we um, we are looking for answers and we're looking to understand the know-how. Understanding the know-how requires you to do the work. Understanding the know-how requires you to get up and say, okay, um, I need to go, I need to find a teacher. I need to go find an instructor. You know, we, we need to be able to tell ourselves that we need to go and learn and we need to be taught, you know, swallow your pride, swallow your pride. You may know a lot in a certain area, but you think you do, but you don't, you know? And because all I knew in this new space is that I knew how to communicate. All I knew is that I, I, I know how to bring people together, host, and talk. That's all I knew I know how to do. But I didn't know anything else that comes with it. So studying is free. Um, studying is truly free. So now at this point, I'm in the lab. I'm studying. And funny enough, besides my coaches or, and mentors, I, I was definitely, I would say, inspired and moved by sports analyst. So this time last year, I was watching a lot of pods. I was watching a lot of sports analysts, um, like a lot of them. And people that I would have never guessed that I'll be watching. You know, of course, you know, everybody is familiar with Stephen A. Smith. Um, I was watching... I, I mean, I was watching Club Shay Shay when he first interviewed his brother, when his brother was his first person that he interviewed. And I mean, I was watching Undisputed. I was watching First Take. I was watching a couple of uh, shows on ESPN. For whatever reason, sports was, and I'm not a sports person. I, I never grew up in sports. I was an academic kid, you know, um, I would say my brother is the more educated person and the most educated, I would say, in the household. 
about sports. He he cares about all those things. I care nothing about stats and any of those things. Not at all. Um, I was watching The Pivot a lot. I um, I was even watching a little bit of I Am Athlete. I was watching so many different shows. I was watching a couple of the uh, female analysts as well. Like, um, um, I would say, like, Shanae... And um, I can't think of everybody at the top of my head, but I was watching a couple of these women and I'm seeing how they, I'm, I'm paying attention to some of these analysts, their body language, the way they're talking to one another, their, their eye contact, how they're responding, and much more. Their, the way they're pronouncing certain words, if they're giving other people the if they're giving other people the floor to speak, if they're talking over them, you know, just different things. So I wasn't paying attention to sports in general, you know, but it was the communication part that I was paying attention to. And I was watching a lot of The Basement with Tim Ross and just different types of pods, like I said. And I can't think of everything at the top of my head, but I was just watching a lot of people that communicate. And the way that they would communicate was very intriguing. I think all of them, um, including uh, Bishop T.D. Jakes, all of them have a unique way of communicating to their audience. So what I realized with all of them is that they all know who their audience was. I didn't know who my audience was yet. So it's not that me studying these analysts or these uh, big name communicators or you know these public speakers, it's not, it's not me watching them because I want to be like them. But I'm just trying to observe, observe how they, how the audience also, you know, connects and engages with them and what makes people keep coming back to them. So now I'm in a place where I'm trying to find my own audience. I'm also trying to understand what exactly is my niche? What is my scope? And I love my mentors for this because I sat down with them and and they were like, you know, what are you, okay, you know, when I brought to them the idea of fellowship, fellowship, first of all, was an idea back in like, I want to say 2018, 2019. And so sitting down with them and talking to them about fellowship, I was like, you know, um, one of my biggest things, and and, and this is before fellowship, is that with friends, family, and even strangers, I'm always... I always try to, I always tell myself, what was the impact that you left them when you left the room? What, what did you leave them? And that was something that was big for me. And also one of the things that I want, that I, I have a desire for people to do is to always live their best life. Not only just live their best life, but to understand that communication is very essential. It's essential and it's a priority. And so I was like, okay, I'm, I'm now I'm writing all these things down. I'm doing a lot of writing. But now I'm like asking myself, okay, you have all these ideas. You're saying all these things. But now how do we now summarize this as a whole? And so now that's when I realized what my scope was. My, my scope was personal growth and development. And what better way than to develop than through a conversation and to communicate, you know? And I find for me, in my experience, that the best way for me to be my best self is to communicate my feelings, to be empathetic, but most importantly, to be a good listener. And I think that's the greatest form of communication. So whenever you guys see people, these past episodes that have been in season one, I try my very best to give people the floor because what I want people to understand is that you should never feel guilty based on your experience. Never feel guilty for your experience. And I want to let you know that not only is this a safe space, but this is a place where not only you're growing, but so am I. As you're learning, I'm learning, you know, and I want us to kind of all just, you know, bounce off of each other. And you know, what was most intriguing why the scope makes sense is because what was intriguing about season one is that all of my guests that were in groups did not know each other. People did not know each other. 
And the fact that they can hold a conversation as long as they did, even though they didn't know each other, was exactly why I was like, okay, God, I heard you. I heard you loud and clear. Because I think one of my fears was, will people be able to talk? And truth be told, I did not want to be the host of fellowship. I remember when I was writing out fellowship and I was writing out episodes and I remember telling God that, you know, okay, all right, Lord, you know, I don't want to be, I won't have to be the, um, the, the host or the moderator because as far as I'm concerned, Lord, you know, I want to give people the floor. I want to give them the, 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 the free will to, to exercise their, their, their voice and all these different things. And, um, I find that I, I had good intentions, but God was like, girl, I'm not convinced. (laughs) So, and how I realized that is because we filmed episode one and I remember someone on my team was like, you know, you should, you should really, you should stick to this. You should do it because if you weren't here, we wouldn't have that conversation. And I found that very, I don't have to, I have to kind of like chew on that for a second because in my mind, I was like, well, you know, I don't want to take it, take away from, you know, people and their time. And, and I was like, I'm not taking away anything, you know, but, um, we'll get into season one. So fellowship, why did I create it to begin with? You know, um, why did I create it? I created it because honestly, I feel like I was pushed into it. I feel like God was like, you need to go. You, need, you just need to go, honestly. Like, it, it's a weird, it's a, it's a, that's a very, very, it's a very um, thick question for me um, because there's, there's different reasons why I think it was finally created. Um, and, you know, funny enough, and this is why I always tell people, you know, um, put God in everything. Be, put him in everything. I mean, every single thing, every part, every crevice of your life. Because he will definitely reveal and show you something that will have you understand that this is exactly what he wanted you to do. So um, the fellowship was, like I said, an idea from about two years ago. It was based on, you know, just me being a chef and my childhood and my upbringing and just, you know, and, and so much more. And if you are a child to immigrant parents, people say it at the house. You know, I don't know, I don't really know any immigrant like that did not have people at their house. And I'm talking about, I'm talking about overwhelcoming, like overstaying their stay. You know, like they're staying for three, four months in the house before they actually go back to Nigeria or wherever country they came from. And your parents are seeing nothing wrong with this. And so, um, so I just remember that growing up and my mom always cooking every single day, not just for um, us, but for also the guests that overstayed, you know, and making sure that everybody's um, calm, home, uh, feel, they feel at home, they feel well hosted and taken care of. And um, that's kind of how I was as a chef. I wanted to make sure that everybody enjoyed their meal. Um, they had, uh, if they had any questions, they had, you know, access to me and much more. So it's based off of pretty much that as in a nutshell, in summary. And, um, you know, last summer, I remember calling um, the, uh, I remember putting up posts, job posts on apprenticeships and things like that. And even while doing that, I was very, very scared too. I was very, very scared too. I just said, you know what, let me just put on some things on LinkedIn. Let me put up some posts and... I did not know I was going to get the feedback that I was going to get. And it's funny because even our uh, camera guy, uh, Daryl, it's funny because he applied, I want to say July, July, August. Correct me if I'm wrong, Daryl. I'm not sure. I forgot. Um, I think it was like July, August. I want to say something like that. And um, I remember like we got on the phone It was great, great conversation. And it kind of ended there. I remember Tierra that handles all of our social media applied as well. And I had other people that applied, but I did not call them back immediately. It took me like a month and a half or like 
almost two months or something like that because I just, I was like, ah, it's not, it's probably not the time yet. You know, it's just, I'm cool. I don't need a, I'm good. I'm good. Um, and I, I wasn't, I wasn't really trying to take it serious because for me, I just felt like it wasn't the right time yet. But I'll go ahead and just put it in the atmosphere. If somebody applies, they apply. And so I remember Daryl calling me and I just so happened to come back from Punta Cana and him saying, you know, just following up and things like that. And I was like, I haven't talked to him in like a month and he's, he wants this gig. Like, I, okay, whatever, you know. And so something just told me call back. Had a good conversation. Okay, boom. And at that point, I think at that point, I was like, I don't have a choice because we had went ahead and booked a mock shoot. And then I eventually spoke to Tierra, and then we hit it off. So at this point, I was really like, okay, Clarice, you don't have a choice at this point. You don't have a choice. So I'm now like, it's getting to the fall. It's getting fall 2023. Um, we're in Q4. And we're hitting, we're in October, um, October, we're in November at this point. And this is like around, I think we had went ahead and booked a mock shoot in November. And we booked the first episode to Film Fellowship in November, in late November. And so I remember just telling myself, like, am I really ready for this? I'm, are you sure? Is this really what you want to do? Because this is, you know, this is kind of a, a weird time. So... It was a very, very inconvenient time, a very, very trying time for me between October and November. Very, very trying. I was still a bit sad. I was still recovering from what I once had. I was still, and that is a real thing. Grieving what you once knew is a real thing. Grieving what you once knew that has always worked for you is is a real thing. So, Please do not feel guilty about that. I'm going to keep on reiterating that. Don't feel guilty about that. But the thing about it is, don't feel guilty about it, but don't dwell in it. Because now that becomes your stomping grounds and now that becomes your firm foundation. When you're grieving these things, it will literally deter you from actually doing what you're supposed to be doing. And that's following your purpose. And I think that for me, I was still trying to, I was having my communication with my parents as well was a bit off because, you know, anybody that knows immigrant parents, when you're moving into something that doesn't seem normal and is out of scope of what it is to be successful, it is very hard for them to accept. And for somebody like me that has always won the hearts of my family and has always been accepted and has always been rooted for I mean, my parents were my cheerleaders. My family are my cheerleaders, you know? But the moment that you step out of scope of something that does not really fit their needs, it is very, very, it's very taxing to the body and to the mind. You start having very intrusive thoughts. You start to almost also dislike your parents. Yeah, that's real. You start to dislike people because they don't agree with what you're doing. And then you now have to get in your space. I really had to. That's why I thank God for my mentors because they had to show me how to discern between following purpose and following money. Um, See, in our culture, success is connected to the coin. Success is connected to, you know, what you have and what you carry. And, you know, it's like I told my parents, you know, having that hard conversation. I honor that you guys want me to be successful. I honor that you guys want me to be great. However, however, there is multiple ways to skin a cat. And there are going to be certain seasons that is going to, it's, it's going to test my faith. And, and it has nothing to do with you. It has nothing to do with my me being disobedient to you. It has nothing to do with me saying that I hate corporate America. No, it has nothing to do with anything. This is bigger than me. These are world-changing things that your children are investing in that even us, we're trying to figure out what this is. So just like you don't know, I don't know. I'm just stepping in with faith, hoping that I'm doing everything to please God the best way that I can. And so even with all of that being said, 
your parents are like, oh, okay. I mean, I, I feel you. I understand. And that's what I also want to let y'all know too, is that y- you don't need an audience to go do what God has called you to do. There are going to be some very unpopular things that you're doing. There's going to be some very out of scope things. There's going to be some things that will, it will trigger other people. And sometimes people are just projecting their fears on you. People are projecting their insecurities on you. People are projecting things that they never got to do. People, maybe it could be even ideas that some people have wanted to do, but they're like, the moment that they hear you're doing it, they're like, oh, it's impossible. Why is it impossible? Because you didn't do it? So some people, a lot of times too, and you know, to give grace and um, or whatnot, I think that some people feel like they're protecting you from being hurt. And how do you know what you're protecting me from if I haven't pursued it yet? If you haven't even pursued it. A lot of people don't even have the example of what it is to chase after what you're supposed to go, what you're called to do. A lot of people don't have the example of what faith looks like. And sometimes you're the very person that's going to be the example. Yeah. Sometimes you're going to be the only one And um, I feel like me and my siblings did some very unconventional things that our parents definitely scratched their head about, you know, but I will say this, I, we, in the midst of us, you know, crying our eyes out, we all three of us would like vent to each other about the new things that we're doing. Um, In the midst of us being, being very sad and hurt and, and, and scared. For whatever reason, we didn't want to stop doing it. We did not want to stop doing it. Nothing made us say, we're going to quit. You will have things that will trigger you to quit. But it's like, I don't know. It's just like you'll be fighting through those tears. And then for whatever reason, at least for me, when I was crying, I was now getting haunted by the future. So the moment that I would cry and be like, I'm done. I can't. I'm now seeing the future much more clear. And I'm like, God, please stop showing me these things because I'm not there yet. I'm not there yet. I just, I need a break. I'm scared. I'm tired. I don't want to do it anymore. And I feel like it's a way for God to speak to me to let me know that for I know the plans that I have for you. You know, and... That's just, that's just a way for him to communicate with me to let me know that I have it already written down. There's already a date on it. And so it would haunt me and I would go, by, go with the method of, Clarice, just do it even if you don't want to do it. And I would always tell myself, what's the worst that could happen? What is the worst that could happen? You know, and here's the thing. Even if I didn't go pursue what God has called me to do, and I went and did something else, it's not that I won't get blessed in that something else, but there will be limitations. There'll be, there'll be limits. There will be, there will be moments where, you know, I will sit and think and be like, man, what if I did pursue this? And one thing about me, I'm a think and I'm a overthink. I'm going to sit and overthink and be like, man, what if I would have just pursued this? What if I would have just invested my time in that, you know? But I, I didn't want to, I just didn't want to experience that. Something in me, even through the tears, even through the frustrations, I did not want to experience that. Um, so pivoting from corporate America into a space like this is literally black and white. And, um, it, th- this space, I will tell you, is by far the hardest thing I have ever done in my life, harder than corporate America, any job I've had, because, see, with this, it's like I was creating it from scratch versus corporate America. I go to my office. The work is already on my desk. I just got to finish it. I'm finishing somebody else's work. So when you're creating something, it, is, it, it hits different because now... You're, you're wearing different hats, but you're also learning how to trust people to wear the hat for you. So that's another thing, you know, because, yeah, it's your baby, but you have to also learn how to 
let people hold the baby, pass the baby around a little bit, you know? Um, and I think that, you know, being in this uh, space also was harder than catering. And I've catered for tons of people, big events, small events, medium events. It's like I said, this is the hardest thing I've ever done. So I didn't realize that I really, really had to get in a place that I had to study. I had to learn. I mean, even some of the equipment that's in, you know, the living room and things like that. I had to like, you know, look up some things, understand the the vocabulary, the 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 terms behind it. And just just in case, you know, um, because Daryl will always make this comment, I'm just passing by. And so I'm just, I would always think about that. And I'll be like, man, all right, well, if I get another team, like I gotta know what this means and what that means and kind of like explain to them how the lighting is. And, you know, so the mock, the mock shoot that we had before we started filming Fellowship, I really, really appreciate it because I didn't know what I didn't know. I had no, I don't know anything about cameras. What I thought, you know, it's funny, the mock shoot actually, I thought that the mock shoot was going to be one camera. I'm so used to working with one camera. I've worked with other uh, production companies and things like that. Specifically, I've only really worked with one other production company uh, called The Engine. And every time I've worked with Sam, we've worked with one with one camera. And footage was fire. And I was cool with that. But I mean, fam, like Daryl walked in with, it was looking like Harpo Studios in here. And so I, and that's another thing too. You don't realize the, you don't realize the magnitude of you saying yes until you go. You just got to walk and you just got to go and, and, and you will figure it out. I feel like every time, every since November of 2023, since we've been filming, um, I feel like there's been nuggets that have been just dropped in every corner. And there's just been nuggets in like my purse. I would just find something. And God is like, there we go. We're going to use that next. We're going to do this too. And um, it's just been really, really interesting to watch because for me, I didn't know the first thing about starting a show. As far as I'm concerned, I had no idea. And um, that was just what it was. I had no idea. But um, I'm very grateful to have turn down my volume. And when I say turn down your volume, I don't mean turning down or dimming your light on who you are to make sure it appeases others. No. But I mean turning down your volume, turning down your will and following his will is what I mean. Excuse me. Um, That's what I mean. And so when I turned down the volume, I started getting nuggets. I started hearing more. And I think when we got into, immediately that we got into 2024, I think that every month since January, there's been a theme. Um, Q1 was a spectacular quarter. Challenging, but an amazing quarter. What we have done in 90 days, I feel like I've done more in 90 days than I've done in my career in corporate America. And it's, and it's very fruitful. It's very rewarding and it's beautiful to watch because we still got, we still got a way to go. I, I still don't think I've hit my peak, you know? And it's interesting because corporate America will tell you as soon as you, it, as long as you just keep, you keep on climbing the food chain, as long as you get at the top of the org chart, you hit your peak. As, as long as you get that managerial role, you're done. You're good. Your, your role is safe. But in this space, it's like, no, it, you just, you are never done. That's what it's kind of taught me, you know? And um, yeah, like I said, every month since January has had a theme. Um, January was um, a month that I was very scared. And um, I remember writing in my journal and I remember uh, just hearing, just getting to the book of Chronicles, uh, Second Chronicles uh, chapter 20 and reading about, I believe it was... Um, King Jehoshaphat and him and his people, uh, there was people that were trying to come and uh, fight them and, and, and kill them off and do away with their land and much more. And the Lord told them that, you know, prophetically uh, told them that like, hey, 
um, the battle is not yours. You know, but you're going to show up to the battleground and you're going to witness your opposition. And you won't have to fight. And so when they made it to the battleground, their op, everybody was dead. It took them three days to carry all of the things that they were owed, all of the gifts. It took them three days to carry it back to their home. And that story still sticks with me because a lot of times we think that we have to fight. We think we have to fight. We think that every battle is ours. We, we want to, we, and it just uh, honestly also tells me that we still battle with control. We still have the challenge of control. And um, I mean, imagine showing up to a battlefield and the person that you're supposed to fight is already dead. And everything that you're owed is sitting right on top of that body. And God is like, all right, carry them all up. All right, y'all can go. It took them three days. And so the blessings that overflowed in January was, was very, very wild for me. Like, I was actually very overwhelmed. Um, and I wasn't even financially where I needed to be either. But the Lord kept providing. February, um, I still kind of battled with a little control. I was getting blessed, but I still battled with a little control. And so I had to start learning about his yoke. And I was like, what is this? Everybody's always talking about his yoke. And, you know, I had to study what that was too. And um, just understanding that his yoke was his burden. And it just so happened to be that that was one of the words at church one day. And it talked about how his yoke is light and easy and it will give you rest. So I was like, you know what? I need, a, I need some of that. I need that. I, I really, really need that. And I started reading, um, reading about that. And I w- realized that, you know, his, we are, I'm supposed to ask him for his yoke. Yes, it's light and easy, and it really is, but he wants it in exchange for my will. He wants, he wants, he wants to take all of my burdens, all the things that I think I can carry and that I can control and that I can and that I think will will work for me. He wants to be able to take that so that he can give me his yoke. So because his burden, it doesn't care, it doesn't have any weight. It's it's not, it's not, it's not, it's not heavy. It's not here to harm me, but it's to give me rest from what I used to know. It gives me rest from my will. And I felt like that was the theme of February, and that's definitely what it was. Um, and then March, that that uh, theme was not to let my hands be weak. And um, I just stumbled upon that, too, in the Word. Um, I believe that was also from uh, Second Chronicles. And um, it said, let my hands not be weak. And what I got, because you're because your work will be rewarded. And what I got from that was that I got to keep going. And the reason why that was very on time, that sp- particular word was on time because in the month of March, I got very discouraged. I got very, very discouraged. There was episodes that I had planned. There was things that I had written out that did not go the way that I wanted it. And I had to get in the space to, to, to now tell myself, okay, Clarice, remember you getting in here is because the Lord sent you here. He brought you here. He gave you a gift. He gave you something. And so because he brought you here, don't you think that he knows exactly what he's doing? So I had to now sit down and say, okay, turn that volume down, turn down your noise and and just listen. And so sitting down and realizing that, okay, just because you wrote it out doesn't mean that it's trash because I, I, can, I can be a little bit extreme sometimes. Like, okay, I wasted my time. I wrote all this out. Now I can't even use it. And God is like, That's, it doesn't mean that you can't use it. Parking lot it. Something I learned in corporate America. Corporate America, parking lot stuff. Put it in the back, put it in the backlog. You know, um, just, it doesn't mean that you will never use it. Just put it in the backlog, put it in the archive. It's okay. Because you might need it again one day. You know, there was um, some disappointments that I felt like, you know, I was kind of, and, and I think that's when I was really understanding this space is that, you know, scheduling, scheduling is, can be very discouraging because sometimes, you know, people's time does not match with yours. Shoot days, um, 
your team's your team has a life, you know. You have a life, you know? And so just knowing how to um, uh, have uh, the mindset to be like, okay, breathe, stop, and, um, and, and think just for a second that, you know, you can go back to your source again and go and ask him, okay, what do I do now that this, this person may not be available or this may not work in this situation or that time doesn't work. What do I do now? Because it's very, very discouraging. Um, and so just learning how to understand that it's okay that it doesn't go your way, know that it's still going, something is going to work because you're not here for, for no reason. So season one, oh man, season one. Season one, um, just reflecting on season one, I am so blessed. Probably overly blessed, if that's even a thing to be overly blessed. But um, I am so grateful for my community, my team. I mean, everybody has been, the feedback has just been something that I, I didn't even know. I had no idea that I would get the, the feedback that I did get. There's people that are reaching out that I don't even know personally. There's people that have seen me um, in public that would say, hey, I related to that person in episode so-and-so. And I just kind of want to just, you know, I, y'all, if you haven't watched season one, you need to go watch that. That's all I'm going to tell you. But I'm not going to tell you everything that happened in every episode because we'd be here all day. Um, but I will just highlight some things that was the most memorable thing from the different episodes. So episode one, um, I think it was one of the most controversial episodes, in my opinion, because um, there was a statement that one of our guests said that triggered um, some of my fellow Christians. <laughs> and, um, and it triggered some people just in the audience in general. And then there are certain things that um, others said that made people think and really made people just kind of sit down and say, wow, maybe I should go and actually talk to someone. Maybe I should actually really under understand and write down my feelings. And maybe I should start writing down all the things that I feel like I should be doing and just pray about it. There's so many things. People got a lot of feelings from episode one. And episode one was like, the test. Like, I didn't even know how episode was going to turn out. That episode was very, very, that was like the, that was the episode I think that was like, okay, it's on now. Like, we here now. We here. And the ladies, uh, funny enough, I actually have one of them that's here. Um, the ladies didn't even know each other. And the way that that conversation even happened it, it, I just, we just let it flow. I had an agenda, but we just kind of let it flow. I didn't know what these ladies were going to say. I didn't know what to expect. I didn't even know. I just didn't know anything. But I knew that God was in the room because it just worked. It just simply worked. And they connected and it was great. Um, episode two, uh, man, that was, I think, episode two has a clip, actually. I think it's like a seven minute or eight minute clip that is actually probably the most watched episode, I mean, clip of all the episodes. And I had that episode with uh, uh, Zakia Gradney of Trendy Guru. And she was, she really made entrepreneurs think. She's a sales coach. I mean, she's amazing. And um, she was very, um, she was, it was more of an educational episode, I would say. And um, I think that episode, I was trying to, you know, it's funny because when I was writing out Fellowship, when I was writing out the episodes, I remember uh, episode one, Nana was the one that I for sure wrote down. I, I've always said I'm going to have Nana on an episode. Um, I did not know that Courtney and Rosalind were going to be a part of that. It was just me spending time with God. I wrote their names down. And, it, and that's how you know it was God because they said yes. They didn't even tell me no. So um, And they didn't even hesitate. And so episode two... Also, um, my episode, like Zakia coming and, and giving her gems and 
and dropping so much knowledge about, you know, entrepreneurship and just kind of like, you know, her transition. She was coming out of corporate America. She was also in corporate America as long as I was. And then transitioning into the entrepreneurial phase and becoming very successful in it. Um, that was that's a really, really good episode. And I think that it showed another side of fellowship. It showed like, you know, just the kind of the informative, the educational side of it as well. I mean, all of our episodes, I think you can learn from. But I just think that it was it was uh, that one was really, really uh, good and thought provoking. Um, content that episode also showed me that content is really king. You never know what people need. So please post your content, whoever you are. Um, episode three. I mean, there was uh, that episode also was unplanned because I didn't know that um, Tierra me and Vanessa were people that I was that was I was gonna have for that episode. I was just like, you know what? Something is telling me to do that. But funny enough, Tierra me doesn't even live in Houston. She lives in L.A. Um, Tierra me and I went to school together, and so did me and Vanessa. But I didn't have these women planned, and it just so happened I just so happened to text Tierra me, and she just so happened to be coming to Houston at a particular weekend that we needed to shoot. And I was like, oh my gosh, that that was God. So, you know, like I said earlier, you know, um, you won't realize it until you just walk, just go. So that worked out. Um, great episode as well. We talked about, you know, just, we talked a lot about, you know, self-love, investing in yourself, um, self-evaluations, really getting to know who you are and dating yourself before you're able to invest in a platonic or a um, romantic relationship, and so much more. And uh, it was funny because that particular episode triggered a lot of uh, fake accounts um, on our platform to kind of give their opinion. But, you know, I'm not going to tell y'all what... Y'all just got to go watch. Y'all got to go watch. But uh, the fourth episode, man, uh, man, that episode, myself, Jeff, his uh, fiance Aaron, and Monica... That was uh, quite the episode because it just kind of said, it was just in a nutshell, four kids coming from four different cultures um, with immigrant parents and um, just really understanding how how to, you know, go through life as first-gen kids and um, and learning and growing and being able to learn how to be independent, um, doing something new, doing something out of the scope of our culture. Um, being challenged by things that um, our parents would try to make us feel guilty about and much more. And that episode, wonderful episode, go watch it. Uh, that that was uh, our probably our most watched episode and the most talked about. Um, not just from, you know, people that I know, but people from people that know them and people that are on the, that are watching us in general. Um, Man, the fifth episode, so unplanned. It was me having a conversation with... That episode was supposed to be another episode, actually, that I had already wrote out, that had already been done. However, um, it ended up being that Gerald was going to be the person that's for that episode. And Gerald was not planned. I just so happened to have a conversation with Gerald. And based on our conversation, I felt like, you know, God was like, led me to tell him that to come on the show. And he didn't even say, he didn't hesitate to say yes. He was like, when do we, wh- where do I sign up? So um, I did that. Um, um, I did not say this. Um, so all the episodes that I have, there's a lot, all the episodes, I started writing them based on what I felt the Lord was telling me to write about. Because a lot of things, I really didn't really know what to talk about. Um, I know that I can hold a conversation, but at the same time, you know, where are we going with this? Because I didn't want any just, you know, generic conversation. I didn't really care to talk about pop culture. I didn't really care to talk about a lot of different things, you know. Um, I just wanted to talk about things that had to do with personal growth development and anything that steps outside of that scope, I'm not doing what I'm supposed to be doing. And so when I would ask God these things, I mean, he would just drop gems and just drop things and I would just be writing and writing and writing and writing. And so um, I'm, I just, I love the fact that some of these episodes were unplanned, but yet he still gave me dialogue. Um, and I loved Gerald's episode because we kind of got a, a male's perspective. He was our second male on the show. Jeff was our first. And uh, just hearing from Gerald, who was um, a father, you know, 
a businessman, um, a friend, a uh, a son to to a uh, some, and um, you know, a, a nephew or whatever. You know, he's he's a lot of things, and he's a, a great communicator. Oh my gosh, a great communicator, very good person, and it's crazy because Gerald um, met my husband and I. We were me and my husband were having dinner um, at a vegan restaurant. And he just so happened to be there by himself. And he, I think one of us asked, hey, uh, what you ordered was that good? And then the rest was history. And we just always kept in touch. And he, we just, we grew to have a wonderful relationship. He supports my husband. He supports me. And um, he still supports to this day. And so it's just amazing to see um, him be on the show and just us have that conversation as if we've known each other for 10 years. So I think that was really, really great. And that's what fellowship is all about, you know? Um, it doesn't have to be necessarily conversations with people that you just know. You know, it could be people that just, you know, that, you know, sometimes God is going to bring you people, you know, destiny helpers or whoever. He's going to bring you people that you did not know that you needed in a certain season. And um, I think it's important to embrace that and et cetera. Um, and then the uh, episode six, that was a very special episode. Me and my mom, um, me and my mom, man, that that was an episode that was so unplanned. And you know what's funny is that we were supposed to only have about, I think, six episodes or so. I just, um, just something just came to me to have an extra episode because I was like, oh my gosh, there was a topic. I think, I don't know if it was Gerald. I don't know what, it was around that four or five, five-ish area that I was like, man, I, I need to do this. I need to do that. And um, and I had talked to Daryl about it and Daryl uh, was so gracious to say yes. And um, my mom being in the lineup was something that I didn't even know that I needed. And just learning so much about my mom and um, our past conversations at home and just on the phone and things like that. I learned a lot about her and I didn't realize that we have a lot more in common than I think. And you know, that even me just saying that, I remember that used to trigger me when my brother would say that because at at a time, me and my mom's relationship was uh, very up and down. It was very, I would say it was very challenging for me because I was in a place where I was trying to explain to her, you know, a lot of my transition and I what what I thought I wanted her to support um, I just hadn't gotten her there yet. And I was so pressed about making sure that she supports this particular space and this particular thing that I think I forgot to just go and just go pursue the space. She will respond how she responds. I'm not responsible for that, you know? And um, I think that once, as time progressed over the uh, course of a uh, number of months um, and having conversations with my mom, what I realized is that me transitioning was also scary for her because you know, seeing it from a parent's lens, you know, they they truly do love you. And they have a very unique way of showing it <laughs> that may not be in a way that I particularly would have gone about gone about it. But I think that when I see it from the eyes of my mom, all I see is someone that truly just wants the very best for me. And also being, um, you know, being empathetic to the plate, to the part that, you know, she didn't even know how to put into words on um, what it means for me to transform and how sometimes me being emotional and sad about it um, affected her, you know. So I had to learn how to, um, you know, really, really put myself in her shoes. You know, I don't know what it's like to be a parent. And I think that's where my, my grace comes from. Um, and you know, I, I love her 10 times even more for, for just even coming on the show and sitting with me and, um, being able to share this space with me because, you know, like my mom shared, she was a journalist, journalism major, um, and communications. And, you know, so just seeing that, you know, her daughter is pursuing something in that space. I mean, I'm not a journalist. I didn't go to school for that. My mom did, but, um, just me being in that space, something that she's dreamed of and she's she's thought about, but, you know, for one reason or another, she didn't, you know, her being in it was really beautiful to watch. So I encourage those that, you know, you got a mama, 
you or you have a mother figure or whatever, and you know, you kind of want to sit down and just kind of share a moment with her, go watch episode six and really understand the dynamic and the raw and uncut conversation of me and my mom. Um, so yeah, that was a very, very uh, unplanned episode. My mom was nowhere in the lineup. But you know, sometimes when when things are unplanned, those are the best times. Um, seriously. So it, uh, and you know, my mom, she's the only episode that I didn't write an agenda for. Something just told me to let it flow. And, um, I just did away with my phone and I was like, okay, I'm gonna just let it flow or whatever. And so, um, I was really, I'm just very grateful for it. But I mean, that was season one in a nutshell. And um, that just being, just some of the episodes being unplanned is still, it's still kind of funny. It's weird to say it, but I'm like, wow, that really did happen over the last couple of weeks, you know? Um, so, so yeah. Um, now we're on YouTube. <laughs> we're on YouTube. And uh, being on YouTube is funny to me because I don't think, you know, I remember being in college and um, being, I, no, after I graduated from college, and I remember I used to, uh, like, I had a lot of hustles growing up. I had, like, I sold hair, I sold CDs. It was nothing I didn't sell. I just didn't sell drugs. <laughs> so uh, I remember um, just doing a lot of entrepreneurial things. And I remember I had made a YouTube, and to, to be one of the things that I sold and marketed um, my bundles on or whatever, and I remember I just made some like comedic video and it was like, you know, it was funny. And I remember, I mean, I deleted it years later because I was like, why is this on the internet? I just deleted it. But I remember I made it in like 2012 or 2013. I think that's the last time I think I did any YouTube anything. And then um, our uh, skincare brand, Skin Tea, um, that brand, I created a YouTube for it for people to kind of like understand um skincare and, you know, how to take care of their skin and all these other things or whatever. But that's the only time I really played with YouTube and to watch all my pods because all my favorite people were on YouTube. And so, um, do YouTube, YouTube. This is my first time actually, like, we're consistently posting and doing all these things on, on the platform. And um, YouTube is great. Um, the thing about YouTube is it kind of reminds me a little bit about TikTok. Um, they kind of, like, go and find your audience and they, they, yeah, they go find your audience and um, they only go and find it until you post it. And you have to be consistent with that particular type of whatever you're doing, you know. So if you're posting just food videos, um, they're going to find people that are looking for food um, or whatever category of food on your videos or, or in, the, in the atmosphere, whatever. Uh, or YouTube land is what I like to say. But... Um, for those of you that are coming on YouTube, I want to let you know this. Um, do not give YouTube more power than your content. Because YouTube is just a place to house the content. Just post. Just post your content. YouTube will not tell you the content to post. Only you know what to post. Um, because I think that we treat we treat social media like social media is supposed to be doing the thing for us. When if we really understood what our gifts was and what we carry, God gave it to us. He's gonna. He's already done it. He's already done it. You know, um, there's a girl, uh, I think her name is like Buku Billions that I recently just started watching. I'm sorry. Uh, bye. I love you. I love you too. Um, there's a girl that, his name is Buku Billions, and um, her platform is called God is My Creative Director. And I was like, absolutely. You know, like, when you let him just direct everything, I mean, you don't have to worry about, oh my gosh, they didn't hit the numbers, this didn't hit this. You do not know who is watching your stuff. You don't know who is watching your stuff. You have no idea. You have no idea who's watching your stuff. And that's the more reason why... You should just post. You know, um, we've had a couple of viral videos on YouTube. I I want to say on accident, but you know, Tierra's just posting and and she's just creating the the clips, and you just go forth. We just go forth and conquer. 
And then, of course, there's going to be more topics that we're posting that are probably going to be more controversial, that are probably trending more, um, that are probably going to hit different for some people. And if it's like, like I said, if it's a trending topic right now, that might get more hits. Or the thing that you think that is not really trendy, that actually may hit before anything else. Um, you know, YouTube creates the data based on what you post. That's just what it is. You know, uh, the ball is in your court. And um, so if you don't post your content, YouTube is not concerned. So I'm gonna need you to post your content. <laughs> um, so um, one thing I've learned with YouTube is that, you know, entertainment uh, is greater than education. Um, but however, however, it doesn't mean you should go outside of your scope. So for fellowship, you know, fellowship, you can argue it's both educational and both entertainment. Um, when I think of entertainment, I'm thinking of uh, things that are that are more than likely to go viral. You know, like um, whether it be like the blogs, uh, gossip blogs, uh, uh, pop culture, anything that's surrounded around those kind of things. Those those are entertaining. Those are actually what's going to get a boost or a lift first before anything. And why I say that is because when it was Super Bowl day, we posted a video of Nana removing her wig and we kind of like fixated it to where it's, um, you know, it's, you know, it was like a point of view, how I feel when Usher performs at the Super Bowl, Super Bowl. And that went viral, you know, that it, it went viral on YouTube. And so, like I said, if something is trending, most likely it might just get hit really more than we think, you know, but, you know, we we like to also not only post, you know, serious fellowship stuff. We also like to have fun, you know, because fellowship is all about laughing, eating, and and having fun and talking and and all these things. It's about people just being people. And so um, we just did it. We just we honestly did it. We didn't know what it was going to do. We was like, it's the Super Bowl. Let's post something about uh, like it didn't have Usher nowhere in that video, but we had Usher's song playing in the background. So. Um, <laughs> so, you know, like I said, um, you need to just create content that best fits your scope. Don't go outside of your scope just because you don't feel like it's entertaining enough. No, because now you're not being authentic. Um, you know, some of you are creating content solely based on trend and forgetting your why. I think that's very, very important that you understand, you know, not just the niche, but you know the scope. Like what? Are, what? Like what? What was your why behind why you started this? If you are trying to help people, I would, I would assume that you want to have helpful resources within those those videos, your long form videos, your short form videos, whatever. But I mean, if you're only talking about things that are circled around something that's outside of your scope, what's what's the purpose, you know, I, I now I don't know what you do and now you're confused, confusing your audience. But most importantly, you are confusing yourself. So um, stay within topics, stay within your scope. Um, like I said, you know, trends are fun. You know, like I said, we did something fun for, fun, for, uh, for uh, Super Bowl, Super Bowl. We did something fun. Trends are fun, but, you know, don't forget your why because it's, it's really, really quick. Um, it's, it's easy to do that. Um, so our data as of today, I mean, we are, I thank God that uh, these numbers, um, we don't use the numbers to define fellowship. Um, even if we hit the big numbers one day, you know, even if it monetizes, it do, does what it needs to do. We know that before that, we did the work. That's what we do know. And we're proud of the work that we've done now. And um, we're very grateful for the work that was created. So that's that's what I'm grateful for because, you know, we haven't reached our peak yet. We have not. And even when it looks like we got monetized and we hit those numbers, I still don't think we've reached our peak yet. Um, so we're kind of like, I would say season one was kind of the beta phase for us. It was a beta. And um, it was, I, I, when I think about season one, sometimes I'm like, I know it was kind of a beta for me, but it looks like I, I belong here, you know, and it looks like it was meant to be. Everything just fit and it, everything worked. And um, I was really grateful for that. I thank God for also um, the episodes that didn't happen 
the um because even though I thought it should have, I thank God for the ones that didn't happen. I thank God for even being able to say the word no um or um or declining because you know um when creating fellowship, I was very much so like lord i'm I want to be very particular about who's on the couch. You can't just let everybody in your space. You can't give everybody a mic, you know, and you know, and that's for any creator that's in a space like this or in my position that's a moderator or or you know a communicator. You can't give everybody a mic. And um, if that person is given a mic, it's because, you know, they were meant to be there. That's just me. Or sometimes, I think a lot of times we're giving people mics because we think that um, they're going to do exact, we're, they're going to do something to the numbers. They're going to increase and enhance the data. But, you know, you know, all virality isn't good virality. You know what I'm saying? And um, it's, it's, it's cool to be viral, but what did you leave people with? What gem did you leave people with? What did you leave people with that is going to make people remember, you know, um, who you are, what you are, and et cetera? You know what I'm saying? And so I think that we have to be very, very mindful of the things that that we're, we're, we're having people consume. You know, so if we're on a, a in a space like this and we're sharing and we're bringing other people to also come and share the space, we also have to understand as moderators and as leaders of the, these kind of things, there has to be some type of order. There has to be order, there has to be organization, and there has to be respect. So there's one thing that I I did with fellowship is that all of my guests that have come on the show have all signed NDAs. Everybody signed an NDA, every guest, because... What I want people to know is that not that, you know, I don't want you to have the fear that, oh, I'm going to sue you. <laughs> no, but to let you know that you have signed off not only to come be a part of the show and be filmed, but to also respect the other people that are around you. You have also, um, you know, you have also given me uh, the permission to, you know, ask you certain questions or, or get into a, a thought-provoking conversation that uh, still requires you to respect me, you know? And um, that's just what it is. You know, I think that we have people just come on the show and just act all types of crazy. Um, but we're like, well, I mean, it's still content. And I'm like, okay, yeah, it's still, it is still content. And I'm not going to sit here and act like those things don't go viral. But at the same time, if it's not within your scope, you know, what what is a- absolutely the purpose now you're forgetting your why like i said so i think that um we need to be very mindful that when you're in the position that i'm in, that i'm that i'm in if you are a host and so much more respect and order and organization has to be a like the three essentials it has to be the three essentials and you know it's just you know i am I'm very, very big on that respect. And I have been, I'm so grateful that every guest that I've had on the first season has been respectful, has been loving, inviting, and so much more. And who knows, I might be challenged in the future. You know, I I have no idea, but I know one thing's for sure and one thing's for certain. If we got through a whole season, you know, with the type of guests that we had, I could only imagine the future seasons will have just as great um, guest, um, if not more. Um, I'm grateful we actually, um, we reached some, we did some milestones. We made a, a couple of milestones in Q1. Um, and we reached those who we, we were supposed to reach. We did not reach, um, for like, you know, and, and even talking about reach, you know, cause people are always like, man, I'm just trying to get, I, I want to get to these people. I want to get to this people. I want to get to this number of people. And it's like, yes, but you also need to understand that even if it's one person, know that you still reach them, even if it's one person. Because it's like I tell, um, I'm a business coach as well, so I tell my clients that book coaching sessions with me, and business coaching with me, is that one client, know that there's three people attached to each client. And I say that because there's one person that knows at least three people. And somebody might argue, oh, people ain't got no friends. It, people know, there's somebody, one person knows three people. There is someone attached to every person that chooses to buy your product. For sure, for sure. And so 
I feel, and and I be, and I know that because in being here, I remember speaking on a panel and meeting a girl, and um, her telling me that she related to Nana from episode one so much. Um, she had to go and watch the episode in full. She was like, "That was me," in when my mom um, passed away. That was me. I went straight back to work. That was me, and I didn't know how to combat this. And so when she told me that. I immediately was like, wow, we here. Like, okay, we we reached somebody. And that was enough for me as far as I'm concerned. And, you know, social media will have you thinking that you need to compare yourself. But what y'all fail to realize is that, you know, we are all different individuals and what they were called to do is what they were called to do. We're, we're not the same. You know, people will say YouTube is so saturated, is oversaturated, and so much more. And... I think a lot of times, I think that's just a a cop-out excuse. I think it's an excuse that something is always oversaturated. Nobody got your juice. Nobody has your juice, period. And so I think that you still have something to give, even if you're in the same industry. If, if If it was, if I listened to something being oversaturated, I would never be a chef. I would never be a caterer. I'd never be in corporate America. I've never I would never do this, you know, but you know, this is this is this is my way. This is fellowship. Fellowship is different from, you know, um the basement, the Joe Budden podcast, the pivot, the the uh the this, the that. It's it's different from all those places, you know. Um and and that's just what it is. But a lot of people don't see it like that. People see that they have to be like other people. And I'm like, no, you don't have to be like other people. You got, you have your own juice and they are just applying their own to theirs. So be mindful of that. Um, But man, um, you know, I think all of this, you know, kind of in conclusion, um, I think that to to just ask you guys to be frank, you know, how, how far are you willing to go? How far are you willing to go to be uncomfortable? How far are you willing to go to break barriers? How far are you willing to go to break out of your shell? Step out of the scope of what you once knew. How far are you willing to go? Are you ready to be all in? Um, After hearing my story, and I mean, I I gave y'all a summary, you know, but, you know, how far are you willing to go? Um, Because what you're asking God for, you know, it requires a measure of commitment that not even you're prepared for. And you're the one that's called to do it. And it's very tough. It's very, very tough to to accept what he's given you. It's very, very tough. It's very hard. It's very difficult. And as far as I'm concerned, you you have to just be in a place to commit. You have to commit. Most importantly, you have to be obedient. You know, people think that, you know, going back to what I said at the beginning, oh, that you need the money, you need the this, you need the resources. No, you need obedience. God is looking for your obedience. He's looking for you. That yes is just a snippet of the obedience. It's just a snippet. That obedience is you actually doing the work, even if you don't even know the outcome, even if it doesn't come out the way that you want it to come out, you know? Um, and I think that's really important for people to understand, you know, because fear is going to happen and it is so, it can be very, very painful. It can be challenging. It can be so painful. Fear will tell you, you know, that you shouldn't do it. You're going to get embarrassed. You're going to lose your credibility. You're going to lose money and et cetera. And, you know, that's exactly what happens when you're in the seed stage of something. That's when the enemy will give you intrusive thoughts. You know, think what you want, but know that those thoughts that you're thinking against yourself, you're, you're dwelling in that. You've made that your house and your firm foundation. And some of us believe those thoughts so hard that we start to say it out of our mouths. And words are very, very powerful. So, You know, what I've started doing, what I've been doing for months, I would say is, um, I would say for a year, is every, I have have an alarm clock 
My husband laughs at it all the time, and my sister. I have an alarm clock at midnight, and the alarm clock says, hallelujah, we got the, the deal, the endorsement, and the contract. And I say that every day at midnight when that alarm goes off because words are powerful. And when I say this thing, it used to scare me when I, when I first said this a year ago. But now it just rolls off the tongue. We got the brand endorsement. We got the contract. We got the deal. We got the brand. We Whatever. We got it. You know, and I don't know how we're going to get it. And I'm not really concerned with the details. Please believe I'm not concerned with the details. Because if I got this far, oh, the possibilities, you know. Um, but there's a measure. There's a measure of commitment you have to have to the assignment. See, what we need to understand is that when we're doing something like this, it's a responsibility you know, it's a commitment that we've given God to take the responsibility to go and do, to go and pursue our purpose, you know. And it's not really for us because somebody somewhere is praying for you to be their answer. This video, I don't know, somebody could be actually praying for an answer to make the next step or take the next stride. I don't know, but um, I made it my business to, to still commit to it even if, if I was nervous as hell to do it. <laughs> so um, that's, that's my thing. Um, you know, don't make yourself so conservative that you start to alter, because it can alter your ambition. You know, um, you, you got to want it to get it. You got to want it to get it. Don't make yourself too corporate, because that was me at one point. I make myself too corporate. If it's not in this order, if it's not in this way, we, we can't pursue it right now, you know. Um, we have to stop thinking about what you have and start thinking about what you want, you know. And some people will say, well, focus on what you got now, what you got now. Yes, but also don't, a lot of times, some of us, some of us are focusing on what we have because it doesn't look like enough. And so when we focus on what we have because it doesn't look like enough, now we have now conditioned and told ourselves and drawn the conclusion that we can't do it, that we are, we're not able to do it. And so, um, because truth be told, you know, which I understand, I've been there, in certain seasons, we just don't have the resources to, to do what we're called to do. But, you know, if we're just supposed to, if we're just walking by faith, I don't think faith, I personally don't believe that faith comes with you needing to have the money and resources, you know, or the people, you know. Um, just know that the resources are going to come gradually. I am a pure witness to it, a pure witness to it. Um, you have to, I think a lot of us don't have um, much. so it kills us to start and we don't have the desire to grab what we want because we're looking at the right now. So, you know, for those of us that do have it, because I've heard this from even people that I love and care about that they do have it, but they still don't want to do it because they just don't want to. So what I realized too hearing that is that it's not even about money. It's not about money. It's not about resources. It's just that some people just don't have the will to. Some people don't really have the will. Um, I think it's time that we start building our faith now because we're, um, we get to learn more and more about who we are and what we are called to do. You know, um, I say this to say too, you know, if you're, if you're going to use words, um, if you're going to dwell in your words, make sure it's in agreement with heaven. Make sure it's in agreement with heaven. Because what I'm not going to be telling myself is that I can't. It's impossible. Knowing that his word says, I can do all things through Christ. And I'm just not going to be saying things that are blasphemous when he thinks highly of me because I'm his. And you're his too. And I think that, you know, we, that the, the words thing is very, very important because usually in the seed stage, the beginning stage, and when we're almost at the finish line is when we say the worst, worst things to ourselves, is when we say 
when we curse ourselves and when we rob ourselves of the opportunity that God has given to us. Um, so you don't have to be perfect. You know, there's a difference between perfect and perfect. Perfect is you seeking perfectionism. You're trying to, um, perfection, you're trying to, you know, make something, I mean, it doesn't have a solid hair on it. And we all know that it's impossible for us to be perfect. We're not perfect people. But to perfect, you are adding finishing touches, you're refining, you are updating, making sure that you have the right things. You know that it's not perfect, but you're like, okay, this is what we need for right now. And you're editing. So if you're just perfecting something before you start something, that's okay too. But know know that there is going to come a time where you're going to have to stop trying to perfect. That it's going to take for you to do the work for you to keep perfecting. Like season one, honestly, I I know that I still have some work to do as far as, uh, you know, communication and just writing and so much more. Um, Just the ideas that I'm curating and thinking of. I still have things that I want to do. And so, and I, it's not perfect and I'm not seeking perfection. I'm just looking to keep perfecting every season. I actually had a viewer tell me that every episode that she's watched, she feels that she's seen the growth from one to six, you know? So that, and that alone makes me feel really, really good because I don't want people to think that we're over here just seeking perfection. Um, I'm going to say it again, change your environment. Change your environment. Unplug if you have to. Spend some time with yourself. Date yourself. Love on yourself. Invest in yourself. Take care of yourself. Make sure that you prioritize God time. Prioritize it. Because that's when I think I heard the most. Is when I just kind of shut the world out and got in a quiet place and sat with him. And that it was it was just beautiful. Um, I think changing your environment is very, very important. You know, um, you know, some of us, some of us want to be multimillionaires, billionaires, zillionaires, whatever. Some of us want to be financially stable. And yet a lot of people in our environments or in our circles are one, either not financially stable, um, they're talking about their dreams, but they're not implementing them. Um, They're talking about being well-off, but they have no idea what well-off is. Um, And no one is a millionaire in your circles. So why are you talking to other dreamers about something that you're trying to reach? Y'all are just dreaming together. And that probably sounds harsh, but it's the truth. You know, Um, I have a very, I have a childhood friend of mine who is a millionaire. And, um, she uh, took me to a basketball game and uh, just wined and dined me. And I asked her, I said, so what is one of your biggest things? What is your biggest take since, you know, you're, you have seven figures now, like you, you making some M's now. And so she says, um, to talk to other millionaires. And I was like, oh, do tell. And she was like, just learning how to retain it. Cause it's one thing to get it, but it's to retain it and to make more. And, I was very intrigued because a lot of times people will ask people that have that type of um, that type of money, you know, what, what, how did you get here? What was the story? That was all she had for me. I just talked to other millionaires because I'm here, but how do we not retain it? You know, you can't be saying you want to be a millionaire and you're talking to your other friends that are dreamers. Y'all just dreaming together. I mean, Y'all can chew on that and take that for whatever you want it to be. I mean, that's fine. But, you know, when I had that conversation with her, I mean, that made it made a lot of sense. And I mean, we spoke in depth about um, about that. And I mean, it was it was a real conversation. And I think that, you know, I just say this to say that. Change your environment, not because the people are bad people in your circle, but because there's an aim, there's a place that you're trying to go. And those people in your circle may not be be the ones to take you there. You're going to have to go out, seek, and connect with people that do fit in that circle um, that you're trying to gain, and then go forth and conquer. Because you're not going to do that with your 
current friends, if that is your situation, you know. Um, that's just what it is. Um, so please understand that, you know, it's good to have friends, but it's also good to have friends in spaces that are in the places that you're trying to go, um, for sure. Um, if you are new to YouTube, please be more concerned with being valuable than liked and being fruitful than liked. Um, because you have no idea who's watching you. Like I said previously, you have no idea. Um, the ones you, the, the, the content that you feel like you need to throw away is the very content that you're actually supposed to post. Believe it or not, you're supposed to post that content and, um, you don't know who needs it. You have no, you absolutely have no idea who needs it. Um, like, please use your platform and go steward your gift. Go and steward your gift and disregard who likes you because that is very irrelevant in your message. It is so irrelevant. Um, that's just what it is. And I mean, I, I feel as though we're so focused because social media has, has given us an audience um, for people that we know and people that we don't know that we're trying to please so hard. We're really trying to push the narrative that we are doing great and, and so much more when inside of us is we're we're crushed we're hurt and so much more and we're trying we externally we're trying so hard to make people like us and the people on the outside have they don't care they could care less they're not concerned because they're also living their own lives and they're going through their own problems and they're stressing them their own so they they just don't tell you that you know and people on social media only post when they're doing well they're never going to post a lie or I'm sorry, they're never going to post the truth. They're going to post, they may post a lie, but they're never going to post the truth. Um, so please know that. Um, wow. Um, we spoke about a lot. Uh, so season two, what is new with that? I think season two, um, man, talks of season two. I don't have a date on season two. I don't have a date on season two. But Season two, I'm going to just say this. I'm going to leave this there, here. Different location. And that's what I'm going to leave y'all with. Different location. Different location. Um, the plans and things that I have for fellowship and what God wants to do with fellowship, it's beyond me. <laughs> it's, it, it's, um, I, I, I can't even say that I'm scared either. Um, I would say that I'm anxious uh, more than anything, I'm, I can't wait. I, I want to see it now. I want to see, okay, what's going on? Like, I want to know what's going on. Why is he, uh, what is he keeping from me? And, and what is he about to reveal? And just the timing of everything is just just worked out. Um, but season two right now, um, my main focus right now is to take a break. I need a break. I need to take a break. We've been filming for five to six months, planning this. This has been actually more than a five to six month thing. This was this has been an idea for about two years. We just filmed for that amount of months. Uh, the planning, even before um, hiring the team and putting people together, that was a lot. I was in a very, very weird space. And um, the fact that I look at fellowship and the fact that it was birthed in um, a time that was very, very inconvenient and trying for me just goes to show you that, you know, it's exactly, God is going to always do what he wants to do. And it's exactly what he wanted. And um, I'll, I'll say this too, is that um, God births new things at inconvenient times because it's convenient. I'll say that one more time. God births new things in inconvenient times because it's convenient. And I say that it's inconvenient because, first of all, what God does is not inconvenient. But I say that it's inconvenient because a lot of times some of us that are trying to attempt to do something new um, in new spaces or whatever you're in, whatever season that you're in, um, it doesn't feel right. It just seems like everything at once is happening. Your world is upside down. You are emotionally unstable, emotional, un emotionally unavailable. You are going through financial situations. You are having family issues. I mean, the rest, 
I mean, some people are going through uh, grief. People are grieving. People are going through so many different things um, in, at inconvenient moments. And you know what I love about inconvenient moments, though, is that God shows you the beauty of them, that he can use any time and any day to show you exactly who you are in him. And um, I say that it's convenient because God is like, if I didn't birth this now, you would have been distracted by them. Because when fellowship was, was created, it was in a very, very inconvenient time. I was like, oh no. I mean, even up until the week before we, we filmed C- episode one, I was like, I don't want to do this. I, man, I, I, don't, I don't feel good. I'm so sad. And um, if what I wanted to happen during that time happened, there would be no fellowship. I know, I know me, I would have put it back in the closet, closed the door until probably 2028. 20, I know myself. And I, or I probably would never got to it. So the timing of all of this, even the timing of this ending is so beautiful. It's, the, it, it's so beautiful. And I need a much needed break. I need a, uh, I just need to, you know, just sit down and kind of just uh, reflect by myself on all the goodness, all the good things, all the, the, this, the goodness of God in general and what he's done for me. And I'm just, I'm just so grateful. Um, seriously, I'm grateful for my community, my, my family, my team, my everything, because I just, I, sometimes I cannot believe I'm here. I really cannot believe I'm here. Um, but, um, we talk about timing, um, so I guess while I'm, and while I'm taking a break, I'm going to be working more so on, you know, our rebrand. We've rebranded SRC Kitchen, which I am uh, the owner of. And we have, we started our seasoning collection. I published my first cookbook. This cookbook was started being written um, in 2018. Um, 2019 or 2020 ish, I wanted to independently publish. And for whatever reason, I just didn't continue it. And then last year, it's funny because somebody prophesied to me. was like, you said you're a chef. Um, I see a book and things like that. I didn't think nothing of it. And I just went back in, into the lab and I looked at the draft cookbook that I did have. And I realized I didn't even go past one recipe. And so um, this is our paperback version of uh, the 21 I Ball It recipes. So yeah, introducing the the first SRC Kitchen Cookbook, um, twenty one I bought it recipes. You can buy it on the website. It is uh, definitely uh, it is it is it's just funny to look at this book. You know why it's funny because I wrote this book. I finished it last year, but I started writing it in twenty eighteen, and so um, this book it's just it's it's weird to hold it in my hands. This is the paperback version. This. I, I tell people, look, the hardcover is the best. It has premium color. This is still nice color. It's in standard color, um, but it's just something about a hardcover. I don't know why that looks better in a, cook, in a, in a kitchen. That's just me and on a cookbook stand. But um, it's 21 recipes. And the most uh, unique thing about this book is that there's no measurements in here. It's measurementless. This book was actually um, one of the things that also inspired Fellowship as well. Um, which I talk about in the book a little bit. Um, and it it's pretty much a book to challenge a novice cook or even a seasoned cook to, please, why are you using, don't use a measuring spoon. I, I tell people, people always ask me, well, how do, you, how do you know how much to put in here? I said, let the Holy Spirit lead you at this point. Let, let, let it measure it for you. And I mean, I've never, I don't use measuring spoons. The only time I use measuring cups of any kind is when I'm baking. With cakes, when I, I, I used to be a baker, um, with cakes, you have to be precise because you can have a cake that's too dense, too dry. You know, you might have a cake that might sink in, you, all types of stuff. You don't, want, you don't want any of that. But when it comes to cooking, my biggest advice and tip to those that are novice or beginner cooks, season slowly. Season slowly. But, um, but yeah, I'm very proud of this book. Um, it's just recipes that I've had over the years. And um, I, just give, I guess I'll give y'all a little, you know. It's a little picture. It's a little picture, but I mean, that's all I'm going to give y'all. You got to go buy the book. Um, but the book, um, the link is going to be in the episode. 
is that um, our seasoning um, se- um, se- our seasoning website is called Smoke and Spice. Um, S M O K E X S P I C E dot com, and it's our our seasoning collection, our cookbooks and guides. Um, this is a seasoning collection that even with that, the timing of that is great because um, we, me and my husband, are, we love to cook. My husband has a barbecue business. I was a chef for X amount of years, 10 years, whatever, and um, which I still create content on food if you follow SRC Kitchen Co. Um, on Instagram and on TikTok. Um, we love to do all these things. And we thought, you know, what better way than to have Seasonings. I've always wanted seasonings anyway. Um, I think that the seasonings as well are uh, just a kind of a, another way for me to kind of keep staying in the food industry. Um, and I love, I, 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 my food stays seasoned, first of all. Let, let me tell you that. You, you got to season your food. Um, but I love the fact that my, um, my business is just so versatile now. It's, it's an all-purpose kitchen is what I like to call it. And I love the fact that I'm doing this with my husband. Um, I think that's the one that really, really, um, I think I love the most is because this is with him. And this is something that we've always wanted to do. Uh, that idea was kind of planned in like 2017, 2018. No, I would say 2018, 2019. I was making like seasonings and like I'll put together like blends and... Um, different kinds of uh, sauces and marinades together. And I'll be like, man, I, I just want to have my own collection one day and things like that. And so me and my husband, we just kind of sat down. And it's like, I think it's time. And honestly, I didn't even know that I would be publishing a book this year. I did not know that um, we would be having seasonings this year. Um, so we, this is, we have only two seasonings right now that we're selling. Um, but in the month of May, we are selling three more. Um, and that's going to be your everyday essential. I'm not going to reveal those seasonings yet, but these are everyday essentials. Know that you'll you'll definitely love these seasonings. And I mean, we've gone through different tests and tastings, and we finally found an amazing formulator that is helping us hand make this and formulate this together. And it's amazing. And so... Um, here is one of our seasonings. It's a suya spice, and it's called aboki. And um, my husband and I, we go home all the time. We go home as in Nigeria. We go back to Nigeria. And one, you can't go to Nigeria without eating suya. That it just doesn't make sense. You got to go to a joint. You got to go. I mean, there's, there's, there's so many places around. You, you, you got to have suya. It just doesn't make sense. And um, this, it, it's a very authentic suya spice. We have it in three flavors. We have mild, spicy, and very spicy. And um, this is our bestseller right now. Um, if you are into spice, if you've never even experienced suya, um, I think you should. If you want to make it at home yourself, please go and do that. Um, but order the suya spice because this is authentic. Don't don't order that 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 dingy one that be up in the stove, child. Um, the one that they say that is African, but it's commercialized. And we, I just don't think that Africans made that one because it don't taste right. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, Aboki is, it's, we're very proud of this. The name, um, I actually, I forgot what we were going to call it at first, but Aboki just came to me. It just like, I, it was like God just said, we're going to call it that. It just came to me. So that's what we, that's what we call it. But um, this is on sale right now on the website at smokeandspice.com, also in the bio. Um, not only in the bio, but also the details under the episode. All of that is going to be inside. Um, we also have Jollof Gods. Jollof Gods is uh, a a Jollof rice spice. It's a seasoning that, you know, so Jollof rice. Jollof rice requires a lot of seasonings, and it's a number of them. So think about an all-purpose spice for Jollof rice. Um, but I, don't get me wrong. When I, when I use this, I still add... Uh, my Maggie cube. I'll add a little salt and things like that. This is this is like a it's a very it's a smoky spice. So all those things like when it comes to cayenne, paprika, bay leaf, nutmeg, garlic, all these different like the different types of spices that I typically use for a pot of jollof rice is all up in here. It's all in here. Um, so I would say order this. I and this was 
I'm I'm very proud of this one too because Jollof Rice, when I was a caterer, um, I I so that was my bestseller. I sold a lot of Jollof Rice, a lot of Jollof Rice, and I still have clients that still hit me up. Clarice, I need a pot, I need a pan, I need a pot, and I I still do it for them, but I do it because I know them and they, because they they keep ordering it and because they're they're my main clients. I mean. I do it for them. I don't. I don't really. T- I don't take new clients. Please, I, I don't. Um, but I mean, every well, let me not say I don't take new clients. Every now and then, I sometimes. I'm sometimes I'm nice. Um, and please, I'm in Houston, so don't think I'm in your state or your city, wherever you at. I'm in Houston, so don't tell me to ship. You know, jollof rice. You can get shipped jollof gods though. Jollof gods is what the season is called. Um, and you can also order this on Smoke and Spice. I'm very proud of these two bad boys right here. Um, we have, like I said, a number of seasonings that is coming out this this year alone. Uh, we have a limited edition that's coming out this summer. We have some things coming out as well. Um, we have our, our summer collection. So it's grilling season, y'all. So we for those that like to be on the grill, those that like to... Uh, to uh, barbecue, you name it. We have something super, super special for you guys. So be on the lookout for that. Um, subscribe to Smoke and Spice um, and, and go and sign up, go and order, go and do whatever you need to do. And if you have any questions, we have customer service on our website that will answer all those things for you um, when it comes to ordering, when it comes to shipping, when it comes to any of those things. And we also got a frequently asked questions page that you can also read because reading is fundamental. Um, but anywho, guys, um, I feel like it's only right. My my friend Courtney left, but um, she bought me, well, two bottles of Moet. Um, and... Um, I just want to cheers to the future for whatever it beholds. Um, I'm also cheering for you guys too, for those of you that are getting into something new, those that have finally set, told God yes, those that have finally used the word no, because some of y'all, that's a milestone too. No is a milestone for some people. I know no is one of my favorite words or statements. <laughs> like, I can say no with, with no issue. But for some of you, no is something that you're just now learning and you're just now realizing how invigorating it is to say the word no. Now, I don't know what you're saying no to, but I hope it's something that, you're, I hope you're saying something, saying no to something that will actually help you in where you're going. So I do want to um, give hats off to you. Um, thank you for just letting me sit and and give my whole spiel and talk and kind of get vulnerable and let you guys know about what's going on and just kind of reflect on season one. Um, I'm praying for an amazing, amazing rest of 2024 for you. Uh, I know I'm I'm having an amazing year so far. Q2, um, as we're in Q2 now, the beginning, um, I'm praying that you go back in the lab and open that journal, start writing and actually take what you wrote and go do it. Actually go do it. So cheers to you and cheers to me. But um, I'm out now. Peace.